In honor of World Diabetes Day, designated to raise awareness of diabetes, its prevention and complications, we're thrilled to welcome Dr. Daniel Donovan for his grand rounds on antihyperglycemic agents for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. Dr. Donovan received his medical degree here at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. He completed his internal medicine residency training at Columbia University, followed by a fellowship in endocrinology at Brigham and Women's Hospital. He joined the faculty at Columbia and served as director of the Irving Diabetes Research Unit and was named a patient-oriented research scholar. He has been a principal investigator on many clinical trials, including Accord, Sprint, Dream, and many others. We are thrilled he has returned to Mount Sinai as a professor of medicine and director of clinical research in the Diabetes, Obesity, and Metabolism Institute. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Donovan. Well, it's really a pleasure to be here. I somehow never thought when I was a medical student that one day I would get up uh, as an attending, let alone a professor of medicine, but I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, and to talk about some kind of exciting things. I'm gonna start with uh, disclosures. I have a lot of research support from industry. And just a moment to dedicate this talk to Tom Bigger, who many here may know. He passed away a few weeks ago. A leader in cardiology, a leading person in clinical trials. He did the uh, CAST trial, which was supposed to demonstrate that these great type one drugs that killed VPCs would save lives, only they killed people. And he taught me, and the trial was stopped. So he taught me a lot about clinical trials and about equipoise in going into a clinical trial. We don't always know the real answer until we're doing it. And um, the, I think that the most wonderful thing anyone's ever said to me in, in my medical education, or as my time as a practicing physician and clinical researcher, was one day he turned to me and said, you know, Dan, you're an excellent clinical trialist. And uh, so I dedicate this talk to Tom Bigger, who led many of the trials that were just mentioned uh, while I was at Columbia. His memorial service is on December 2nd. So, some learning objectives. We're going to describe uh, mechanisms of action of some of the newer antihyperglycemic therapies. We're gonna talk about the results of recent cardiovascular outcome studies, which are proliferating, and soon it will not be possible to give this talk in one hour, and discuss ways that we might think about developing an individual patient-centered approach to the treatment of type 2 diabetes. So, as you're all probably aware, there are recent estimates by the CDC, there are about 30 million people with diabetes. That's about one in 10 individuals. The majority of them have type 2 diabetes, and about one in four uh, people with diabetes don't know they have it. That's better than it used to be. There is a whole cadre of people waiting to become a part of this pool, 84 million people with prediabetes, incredibly expensive disease, $245 billion in uh, expenses, including loss of uh, productive work days, and a mortality that's 50% higher. And we know lots of complications. The microvascular complications, leading, still leading, a leading cause of adult blindness, still a leading cause of non-traumatic amputations, and still a leading cause of uh, end-stage renal disease, let alone the market effects on macrovascular disease. And so we kind of have accepted finally that we can deal with uh, prevention or uh, reduction of progression of microvascular disease with better glycemic control. The question has been, what do we do about macrovascular disease? So you can see that the slope has increased. Uh, some estimates are that one in three people by 2050 will have diabetes, an extremely burdensome disease. So this actually comes from my epidemiology and biostatistics book when I was a medical student here at Mount Sinai. Uh, anyone know what study this is? This is the University Group Diabetes Program which has been widely criticized, although when really examined in detail, there weren't fatal flaws. Paul Meyer, who was one of my biostatistics uh, professors at Columbia when I was in the School of Public Health, reviewed it and didn't find major flaws. But the frightening thing, and this kind of informed us for many years, was that treatment of diabetes, either with sulfonylureas, there was a fenformin arm way back when, or insulin, actually had worse outcomes than people who got placebo. So really, the take-home message when I was uh, a medical student and Dr. Elliot Rayfield gave me my diabetes talk, which I remember quite well many years ago, many people believed that really it didn't matter what we did. People who were going to develop complications were going to develop them. If people who were not, were not going to develop them. Because there were cases of people who seemed to have excellent glycemic control 
who had developed horrible microvascular complications and people who had terrible control who never did. <laughs> Uh, except we didn't have great ways of measuring uh, glycemic control back then. Uh, urine tests were done, so it wasn't that informative. So this was in the back of my mind. Many people didn't believe this. This led to the start of the United Kingdom Prospective Diabetes Study. Uh, people were desperately looking for ways to demonstrate that better treatment of patients with diabetes would lead to improved outcomes. So we're going to focus on the vascular disease. Patients with diabetes are two to fourfold more likely to have heart disease. They're two to fourfold more likely to have a stroke. They're two to eightfold more likely to have heart failure. And many people feel this is an underestimate that at least 70% of all diabetes related deaths are associated with vascular disease. And some people say it's greater than 90. So we have evidence that we can reduce risk for complications for microvascular disease, uh, certainly from the DCCT trial, uh, which came out in 1993, the year I finished my fellowship, showed that in type 1 patients, you could reduce microvascular complications by intensively controlling blood glucose. Uh, later, in 1997, the UK PDS in type 2s also demonstrated that better glycemic control reduces the risk of microvascular complications. And a relatively small study uh, in Japan, the Kumamoto study, looked at treating type 2 patients with insulin and also demonstrated a reduction in the risk of microvascular complications. And it's been seen in every trial. Better glucose control does reduce the risk of microvascular complications. Other things that help, blood pressure, we saw that in the UK PDS study, controlling lipids, smoking cessation, also has beneficial effects on the microvasculature. Now, macrovascular disease, that's been uh, a tougher thing to crack. Uh, we know that there are risk factors that apply to the general population as well as type 2 patients, that better blood pressure control, better lipid control, the use uh, when appropriate of antiplatelet agents significantly reduces the risk of macrovascular disease. Smoking cessation is a modifiable risk factor, but glucose, what is the question about glucose? Well, I'm going to summarize very quickly. I'd love to spend a lot of time going over each of these styles. Uh, what we know. Disease, DCCT trial followed up by the EDIC trial, in which they followed well over 90% of these patients many years, over 17 years into the future, showed a reduction in microvascular complications, which persisted. No effect on cardiovascular disease. They were younger people, the shorter duration of diabetes. But following them over the long term in the EDIC trial, there was a significant reduction in cardiovascular disease uh, outcomes. No change in mortality. UKPDS is the type 2 study. Definitely showed a reduction in microvascular complications, which persisted. Uh, except for the metformin arm, um, there was not a statistically significant reduction in cardiovascular disease, although the p-value was 0 0.052. If it had been 0 0.048, we might have said that, wow, better glycemic control does help. However, following over the long term in both of these trials, type 1 and type 2, people who once had a more intensive approach to glycemia did benefit in terms of reduced uh, macrovascular complications. So maybe the long-term studies that we have are really too short. On average, the Accord Advance and VA diabetes trials were three and a half to five years of more intensive therapy. The Accord trial, which I spent uh, between Accord and Accordion about 13 years of my life working on, um, I still remember the day in February, February 6, 2008, when we got a call, you must stop the intensively treated arm. This was a trial that was a two by two factorial trial, had a lipid and blood pressure study. We're not gonna talk about that today. But it attempted to get people to an A1C of less than six using everything in our armamentarium back then. Uh, and we were beat on. If you had an A1C of six, you had to intensify therapy. Looking back, it really wasn't a very practical way of treating people who may have had some unknown consequences. But there was a reduction in microvascular complications, no effect on CVD, and a 22% increase in mortality in the patients in the intensively treated arm. A cord is much more complicated. If you actually look deeply into the study, you can see a number of differences. The people who, there was a primary and a secondary prevention arm, people who had already had an event were at high risk. Longer duration of diabetes, older age, was a risk factor. And if you didn't drop your A1C, if you were in intensive arm, in the first six months, you were at high risk for having an event. Threefold increase in serious hypoglycemia, tremendous weight gain using the agents we had available at that time. So complicated. The advanced trial was another intensive therapy study using a sulfonuria that's not available in the US, uh, glucoside. And it too did not show a significant effect on macrovascular disease or mortality, but again, uh, reduction in microvascular disease, especially nephropathy. And the VA diabetes trial also looked at intensively treating these patients, uh, 
significant reduction in microvascular complications, uh, no effect on CVD, although longer term follow-up, there was a reduction in CVD, but no effect on mortality. So, do we just treat patients with diabetes to reduce their microvascular complications? It's a big deal. Uh, people suffer. But what's killing them? Uh, the leading cause of death in patients with type diabetes, as in most of the population, is cardiovascular disease. Uh, just, again, emphasizing the longer duration of diabetes increases the risk for cardiovascular uh, events. And we have to keep the duration of diabetes in our mind as we think about approaching our patients with type 2 diabetes. So, back when I finished my fellowship, I think we had sulfonylureas and insulin. Uh, and maybe just when I was a medical student, we had some of the human uh, insulins, better than pork and beef pork insulin. So now we have a whole slew. I'm going to focus on some of the newer agents, the incredit inactive agents, both the GLP-1 receptor analogs and the dipeptidyl peptidase 4 enzymes, which prevent the breakdown of uh, the incredins. Uh, also discuss um, the SGLT2 uh, inhibitors. And just a brief mention of insulins, because we've had some uh, newer insulin products that are available. So. Uh, Everybody remember this? When Steve Nissen published his study uh, declaring that rosy glitazone killed people. Well, this is a meta-analysis that many feel should never have been done. Um, I'm one of them. But it did set off a whole series of events that has changed the landscape uh, in taking care of patients with diabetes and in terms of clinical trials. Um, in fact, it caused the need for many, 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 many more cardiovascular outcome trials. Because in December of 2008, the FDA issued its guidance for industry. It's not really guidance, it's kind of like you have to do it. Uh, evaluating cardiovascular risk in anti-diabetic therapies to treat type 2 diabetes. Now, just to remind you that there was a cardiovascular outcome study called RECORD. Um, the FDA mandated that they redefine outcomes and re-adjudicate it. And what happened? There was no statistically significant increase in cardiovascular events. So poor Rosie got dragged through the mud, but it was too late to save her. Let's move on. <laughs> I still use it. Uh, so what did the FDA require? Well, talking about upper bounds of 95% confident intervals, even with a degree of biostatistics, kind of makes me and other people dizzy, but that's what they asked. So in order to get uh, a drug approved, they said you have to look at cardiovascular outcomes and you need to have um, an outcome that does not reach the 1.3 uh, threshold of the not upper limit of the 95% confidence interval to show that there is no increase, significant increase in risk of cardiovascular outcomes. In order to get a drug approved, however, uh, you have to demonstrate that it doesn't cross 1.8. So if you cross 1.8, the drug doesn't get improved uh, because there may be a risk that it increases cardiovascular events. If you uh, do include the 1.8, it is inferior and should not be approved. If you're below that threshold, it's non-inferior and so you can proceed. But if you don't demonstrate that your confidence intervals uh, do not cross the upper 1.3 threshold, then you must do a cardiovascular outcome trial to determine um, that. So what we're looking at is non-inferiority. So is it not as bad as what we have available? Uh, and then there's also uh, the possibility of looking at superiority. In that case, you do not cross uh, unity. So that's what we're looking at today. These are uh, most of the clinical trials that have started after the 2008. And I do not expect you to be able to read this or see it, just that there's many more and more coming. So it's kind of changed uh, the landscape of the number of clinical trials being done to show that our newer drugs are at least not as bad as what we have available. So I'm going to start talking about uh, insulins. We have made some advances. We now have two very long-acting insulins. We have insulin glargine, which has been around for a long time, and it's U100 form. Uh, it is three times more concentrated. Uh, as you recall, insulin glargine is soluble in an acidic solution. It is clear. When it hits the skin, it gets neutralized and precipitates. Uh, having a larger volume increases the depot, uh, and it provides a flatter uh, and more prolonged 
pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic profile. Uh, Half-life is around 23 hours, uh, so you reach steady state. Remember, you need three and a half half-lives to come to 90% of steady state, so about in four days, so you make therapy changes every uh, four days or so. It has a long duration of action. We're looking at single injection studies and has been shown to have less nocturnal and severe hypoglycemia. Just to show you, it's reduced in volume by one third. The depot, when it's neutralized and precipitates, is uh, about half the surface area. One thing that's interesting, studies have shown, compared with insulin glargine U100, that you need between 12 and 17 percent more of the ultra-concentrated form, and there's an idea that there's probably more local uh, degradation. But it's got a more consistent and flatter uh, pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic profile, and in a single injection uh, study, it lasts at least 36 hours. So a flatter background insulin. There was a cardiovascular outcome trial uh, that was started before the FDA mandate called the ORIGIN trial, which we participated in uh, when I was at Columbia. And it looked at adding insulin glargine early to early uh, onset, uh, early patients with a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, including some pre-diabetic patients. Um, and it was a two by two factorial design. It also included a omega-3 fatty acid uh, arm, which I'm not gonna go into. I'm just gonna summarize as I'm gonna have to do with most of the studies I show. There's no time to go into all the details. There was no effect, no reduction in cardiovascular outcomes, looking at the primary outcomes and all the other individual uh, components. One thing that was shown is that there was a delay in the diagnosis of, of diabetes in this trial. So certainly, glargine, and uh, because it's the same insulin in the concentrated form, it's not required to do another cardiovascular outcome study. I'm going to mention the second very long-acting insulin analog, uh, insulin degludec. Um, it forms soluble multi-hexamers after sub-Q injection. I'm going to show you a little cartoon, just because I think it's kind of cute. And it leads to the gradual re release of insulin monomers. It has a 25-hour half-life. Uh, greater than 42 hour duration of action. Similarly, you need uh, about three to four days uh, to come to steady state. Uh, and they did some interesting dosing studies once people were at steady state, varying the time interval between injection from eight to 40 hours with no significant change in glycemic control um, or hypoglycemic outcomes. Both the long acting insulins have been demonstrated to reduce uh, severe hypoglycemia and nocturnal hypoglycemia. So just to show you the little cartoon, it exists as dihexamers in the pen, and that's because of phenol and zinc. The phenol diffuses off, and then these molecules tend to glom together, forming these very, very long chains. And so when injected into the subcutaneous tissue, this is what's happening. Eventually, zinc, and as you may recall, insulin usually exists in a hexamer with a zinc in the middle. And in order to be effective, you have to have the uh, dissolution of monomers to interact with the insulin receptor. So eventually in the subcutaneous depot, zinc kind of peels off and then the monomers are free to interact with the receptor. So a unique mechanism of prolonging the action of insulin. Uh, the DEVOTE trial was a long-term cardiovascular outcome trial with Degledec, mandated because there was some signal in the, in the early clinical trials that there may be some adverse cardiovascular outcomes. Uh, and this is actually the first trial that I completed here. I brought it over with me. Uh, and it showed that it was not inferior to insulin glargine U100. Uh, however, because it crossed the upper limit confidence interval, uh, included uh, one, it was not superior. So all we can say for both insulin therapies is that insulin therapy does not seem to uh, reduce cardiovascular outcomes, at least in the short term, three, to, three and a half to five years of following. Um, very similar A1Cs, uh, there was a significant reduction in hypoglycemia, uh, both severe and nocturnal. We do not like nocturnal hypoglycemia. And evidence has shown if you take a normal person and you subject them to a hypoglycemic insulin clamp, and induce one episode of severe hypoglycemia, measure counter-regulatory hormones, it's quite brisk. If you bring them back the next day and you do it, their response is blunted. So even one episode of hypoglycemia is very bad in terms of being able to respond to the next episode. So we do like insulins that have less risk of hypoglycemia. The ACCORD trial, where we threw everything at these patients, 
there was a threefold increase in serious hypoglycemia along with the weight gain. Uh, so I'm going to move on to the incretin system, um, which has been around for a while now. We have two agents uh, or classes of agents that work in this area. Just to remind you, if we give um, an oral glucose load compared, in fact, this is wrong, this is backwards. Uh, this is an isocaloric or isoglycemic exposure, so the same blood glucose curve. If we give oral glucose, um, we have an increase in insulin secretion as measured by C-peptide. Uh, however, uh, wait, if we give an intravenous, if intravenous uh, glucose load and we measure the res insulin response, I said it wrong, uh, it's there but kind of blunted. If we give an oral glucose load, there is a much more brisk response in terms of insulin. This increase uh, in insulin secretion in response to oral uh, glucose has been called the incretin effect. And it turns out that two major hormones were discovered that are both released by the intestines, GIP, which is, used to be gastrin inhibitory peptide, uh, but it's now renamed uh, glucose-dependent insulinotropic peptide released from the proximal small intestine, and GLP-1, glucagon-like peptide 1, which is released uh, in the distal ileum and the colon. Both of these agents uh, seem to increase the secretion of insulin. GLP-1 probably increases both first phase and second uh, phase, and they account for about 80% of the incretin effect. So oral exposure leads to something else happening that is a signal to improve insulin secretion. Just to review why GLP-1 gets such attention, because it does a lot of other things. In pharmacologic doses, it has a satiety effect. It can delay uh, gastric emptying. In addition to stimulating insulin secretion in a glucose-dependent fashion, it also reduces glucagon secretion, which is actually abnormal in patients with type 2 diabetes. This is a study in patients with type 2 diabetes who were studied twice. Uh, they were fasting. They started the day in the upper 200s. And if you do nothing, nothing happens. Insulin's flat, glucagon is flat. Maybe as the day goes on, in, glucose levels uh, begin to fall slightly. Uh, if you infuse GLP-1, and there's a reason why you have to infuse GLP-1, uh, in the next slide we're going to show that it gets degraded very rapidly. Both GIP and GLP-1 are degraded within minutes by an enzyme called dipeptidyl uh, peptidase 4. So infuse GLP-1, you get this very nice reduction in glucose levels. This is accomplished by the stimulation of insulin secretion. But I want to note that at some point as we begin to approach normal glycemia, if we continue to stimulate insulin secretion, we would be at risk for hypoglycemia. So this does stimulate insulin secretion, but in a glucose-dependent fashion. As our glucose levels come closer to normal, we then see a drop-off in insulin secretion. The same thing is seen um, with glucagon, which is inappropriately high in patients with diabetes and sometimes actually increases after a meal. Uh, both this decreased insulin secretion and increased glucagon drive hepatic glucose production, which is a significant part of the postprandial hyperglycemic response we see in patients with diabetes. So the inability to shut off the liver when we're even in the fed state. So glucagon is appropriately secreased, uh, decreased, uh, and as blood glucose levels come toward normal, uh, glucagon levels return to normal. So unlike the insulin secretagogues, sulfonylureas and glyonides, which are an all or none effect, they turn on the beta cell, this is really a modulator, a physiologic modulator of insulin secretion. So I already mentioned we eat. Our GI tract reduces both GLP-1 and GIP. They have a very short duration of action. They're chewed up by the DPP-4 enzyme. Uh, and both GLP-1 and GIP do increase glucose-dependent insulin secretion from the beta cell. GLP-1 seems to also uh, lead to more second-phase insulin secretion. Uh, <coughs> GLP-1 does seem to reduce uh, excess glucagon secretion from the alpha cell, although there's no evidence that it does this in a direct fashion. So there are lots of theories about how this does it, either other mediators or a paracrine effect with insulin. Uh, and increasing insulin and decreasing glucagon leads to decreased glucose production by the liver, increased glucose by muscle and fat, and maintenance of normal glycemic control. So uh, we do have a class of drugs called the DPP-4 inhibitors. There are five. Uh, one is available only in Europe. Four are available in the US. They are pretty specific inhibitors of uh, this enzyme. I'm not going to go into this in 
gory detail, but they do increase the levels of incredins, both GLP-1 and GIP, by around two to fourfold. Um, this leads to decrease in glucagon, uh, increased responsiveness of insulin to glucose, higher insulin levels and C-peptide, uh, and these agents do reduce fasting glucose as well as postprandial glucose excursions. And when studied in healthy subjects, they do not cause hypoglycemia. Because this is a physiologic system, we do not expect hypoglycemia. Now, hypoglycemia can happen. It happens in placebo-controlled trials all the time. People may have different glycogen store levels, different exercise levels, so we can never say you have no worry about hypoglycemia. We always worry about it. Indicated as monotherapy, combination therapy, but not indicated in patients with type 1 diabetes. Um, there is a risk of hypoglycemia if you combine it with insulin secretagogues or insulin. Um, and the drugs do differ from each other in terms of drug-drug interactions and pharmacokinetics. Uh, all of these medications, except for linagliptin, require a dose reduction in renal um, disease. Uh, and vildagliptin is available in Europe only. Apparently, monkey's tails fell off, and so it never got uh, approved in the US. So we're going to go to the first study looking at the cardiovascular outcomes in type 2 diabetes with um, saxagliptin, uh, one of the DP4 inhibitors. And it was demonstrated to be non-inferior, but it failed to meet the goal of superiority. So at least not as bad as placebo comparator. So no evidence of increased risk for cardiovascular events. So it met the criteria. However, in that trial, looking at other potential outcomes, and I'm not usually going to show all the other outcomes, there was this unpleasant potential signal of a 27% increase in the risk of hospitalization for heart failure. Um, and in this case, it was statistically significant, although it was not a primary outcome, but it did give some cause for concern. We're now going to look at the examined trial, and uh, it used allogliptin, another DPP4 inhibitor, um, and cardiovascular outcomes. There were over 5,380 patients randomized versus placebo. And again, there was non-inferiority, but not superiority. Again, so it was not uh, any worse than placebo. Now, in the total outcome, there was really no other significant signal, including heart failure, where it was close to unity. However, the FDA mandated some increased looking. And when you take into account all the episodes of heart failure that occurred in this trial, there was about a 20% increase, although not statistically significant. This led to the entire class of drugs having a warning about heart failure. The next trial was the TCOS trial, which uh, I participated in at Columbia. Uh, and again, it did not, it was non-inferiority inferior to placebo, so no excess cardiovascular outcomes, uh, which is good. Uh, they actually looked for superiority, and it didn't quite make it. We're still looking for those drugs that improve cardiovascular outcomes. When they looked at hospitalization for heart failure, really, it was unity. There was no signal of increased risk for heart failure, although the citagliptin label does have that warning. Uh, this drug is made by Merck, and they went to the FDA to have their label changed to include this information. Uh, and so no good deed goes unpunished. The FDA has insisted that they re-examine the entire trial, and so they've hired another company to go through all the data and re-adjudicate at least 10% of uh, the sites that were participating in the trial. And of course, I was the largest recruiting, recruiting site in North America, so I am now in the middle of a re-adjudication uh, at an institution that I no longer belong to. Uh, so it's a challenge. Um, so no indication for citagliptin, at least for these studies. The patient populations for these trials were different. They all had increased risk for cardiovascular disease. I'm sorry I can't go into detail with all the um, nitty gritty. It would take way too long. But again, non-inferior, um, two DPP4 inhibitors that have some signal of concern for heart failure and citagliptin did not show it. Um, there's one more gliptin that is in the midst of its cardiovascular outcome trial. So just to summarize, different years in terms of follow-up, different A1C criteria. Uh, TCOS uh, was the longest uh, trial, 
And again, no difference in terms of primary outcome, non-inferior to comparator, uh, but this concern about a 27% increase, which was significant in the SABRE trial, and about a 20% increase, which was not significant in the EXAMINE trial. No signal in the TCOS trial. But again, this warning exists on all DBP4 inhibitors. We're going to turn to the injected GLP-1 analogs, and I'm going to I think, present the two negative studies first. Uh, Lysizenicide is a uh, GLP-1 agonist. It's actually a modification of exenatide, which was found in the saliva of Gila monsters. And exenatide has been used both in a twice daily preparation and in a long uh, acting once a week uh, preparation. And again, the hazard ratio was one. It did not include 1.3 as the upper 95% confidence interval. Therefore, it was non-inferior, but it was not superior to uh, placebo comparator. The Excel trial, uh, which we also participated in when I was at Columbia Finish Up when I came here, um, looked at the long-acting form of exenatide um, once a week. And um, it demonstrated that it was non-inferior, but did not meet the criteria for superiority. Although looking at some of the other outcomes, if you looked at all-cause mortality, there was about a 14% reduction in all-cause mortality. That was significant, but again, secondary outcome doesn't count. And no indication of increased risk for heart failure. So two GLP-1s that are no worse than comparator, uh, but not superior. The LEADER trial, uh, which I also participated in, looked at liraglutide, uh, a once-daily injection of a GLP-1 um, agonist, and patients were randomized to the background of standard of care, and they were to get up to 1.8 milligrams. You start at 0.6, which is not considered a therapeutic dose because of GI toxicity, nausea, vomiting, uh, diarrhea, which usually goes away by uh, three months. First, standard of care plus placebo. So we were supposed to attempt to control glycemia equally using whatever we had available except for GLP-1 active agents, either DPP-4s or injected GLP-1s. So it met its non-inferiority uh, criteria. These were patients at high risk for cardiovascular disease. They could be included if they were over 50 and had established cardiovascular disease or were over 60 with multiple cardiovascular risk factors, and it included a subpopulation of people with um, moderate to severe uh, renal disease as well. A1C had to be over seven. Um, and for the first time, looking at a GLP-1, it demonstrated superiority. Uh, it took a while for the curves to separate, but there was a reduction in outcomes by about 13% using a GLP-1 uh, agonist. Now, A1Cs were lower, there was more weight loss with these agents, DP4s are weight neutral, um, and there was not, it was actually a reduction in hypoglycemia. So uh, if we look at all-cause uh, death, about a 12%. Um, so all three components of MACE, major adverse cardiovascular events, which includes cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, and stroke, uh, demonstrated that they had a reduction in outcomes. So um, there was not an increase in heart failure. In fact, there was a, a numerically reduced hazard ratio for heart failure, but it was not statistically significant. And there was a 15% reduce in death from any cause. Always a nice outcome to see. Uh, again, A1Cs, although we wanted the groups to be equal, um, there was initially a reduction in A1C, and even at the end of the trial, there was still a slight uh, difference. There was a major reduction in severe hypoglycemia and a statistically significant uh, weight loss with liraglutide. And weight loss is seen in general with all of the GLP-1 <coughs> GLP uh, agonists. So I'm going to mention this trial because I was only going to include FDA-approved drugs, but semaglutide recently got a favorable review from the F FDA. It's a long-acting injectable GLP-1, and it's likely to be improved uh, and available very soon. So the, so the same six trial uh, looked at two doses of semaglutide injectable uh, versus placebo, 
um, and then followed these patients um, for a few years. And what they demonstrated was a 26% reduction in the primary outcome, which was MACE, uh, major adverse cardiovascular uh, events. It was pretty impressive. And it met its non-inferiority goal. It did an upper limit of the 95% conference interval, did not include 1.3. However, it did not include one either. So it too has demonstrated superiority in terms of cardiovascular outcomes. So two GLP-1 agonists that appear to reduce cardiovascular outcomes. Now, it's really not clear <laughs> and unlikely that it's due to the lower A1Cs, and so we don't really understand. There are GLP-1 receptors on the heart. Um, weight does come down, blood pressure comes down. Interesting, heart rate goes up with all of the GLP-1. I was always taught that increasing heart rate is a cardiovascular risk factor, um, but it was not associated with risk in any of the GLP-1 trials. So there was greater weight loss, um, and it was sustained compared with placebo. So 90%, 80-90% of our patients with type 2 diabetes are either overweight or obese. So it's nice to have agents that don't uh, increase mm -hmm. weight. We're going to now move to the kidney. Um, and the SGLT2 uh, inhibitor class, the sodium glucose co-transporter class of medications. As you're all aware, uh, the kidney filters glucose, however, it is very effective at reabsorbing it, so that really there's no glucose present unless you exceed the renal tubular threshold of about 180. Uh, this is accomplished by uh, two sets of receptors that are uh, co-transporters. Uh, in the S1 segment of the proximal tubule, there is sodium glucose uh, co-transporter 2, uh, and you can see how it works. Glucose is co-transported with sodium. There is a potassium, uh, sodium potassium ATPase which throws out sodium, brings in uh, potassium, and glucose is also uh, extruded. Now, this is considered a low affinity but very high capacity uh, transporter. So it cleans up about 90% of the glucose that is filtered. Uh, and then SGLT1 has kind of got the job of cleanup. It is considered high affinity but low <coughs> capacity, and it is in the distal S2, S3 segment. So responsible for the cleanup about the 10%. So in normal individuals without hyperglycemia, there is no glucose in the urine. Now, it turns out to be very interesting that in patients with poorly controlled diabetes, both type 1 and type 2, there is an increase in this renal tubular threshold. So going as high as 220, 240. So you think that if you're hyperglycemic, maybe it would be useful to eliminate that glucose. No, instead, patients with diabetes hold on to more of it. Uh, and there was a cohort uh, of, of families that uh, had um, glucosuria, and they were studied, and it turns out they have a genetic mutation in SGLT1. No, nothing except glucose in the urine, no change in life expectancy cardiovascular risk. And so this has become kind of uh, a target. And in fact, targeting SGLT1 and SGLT2 has been around for uh, a while. Um, there's a drug called Florizin, that it comes from the bark of apple trees that was studied in mice, in streptozotocin uh, induced diabetes. Mice streptozotocin kills the islet cells, and you could actually essentially normalize glucose in rats and mice. It's very nice. We do lots of good things. You know, you smile at a rat, you cure cancer, you frown at it, it dies of cancer. Uh, people are not rats, but this system is kind of interesting. So the goal has been to develop specific targets uh, to inhibit SGLT2. Uh, uh, and we have uh, <clears throat> three agents available in the U.S. currently. We have canagliflozin, which was the first one, uh, dapagliflozin, um, and we also have empagliflozin. They all differ in terms of their doses. Both are specific SGLT2 uh, receptor inhibitors. Um, some say that canagliflozin has a little bit of SGLT1, so you can see a reduction in postprandial glucose. It's recommended to give it uh, with the first meal of the day. But both specifically inhibit SGLT2. They can uh, decrease by about 50% the renal tubular reabsorption, so it leads to glycosuria, um, and uh, they inhibit glucose and sodium reabsorption. There's an A1C reduction. Um, uh, reduction in fasting plasma glucose, uh, it's insulin independent, and patients tend to lose weight on them because they're expending 
up to 300 calories extra per day. Remember, you need to lose or spend 3,500 calories to lose one pound of fat. Eventually, they come to steady state. Uh, there have been reductions in blood pressure seen across the, uh, the drugs in this class of four to five millimeters of uh, mercury, and not associated with hypoglycemia when used by themselves. Combining them with insulin or sulfonylureas, again, anytime you combine something with uh, a non-physiologic uh, in uh, insulin increaser, um, you're going to have the risk for hypoglycemia. Now, one thing that's nice is insulin dependent. There's weight loss. Uh, there's a low risk for hypoglycemia. There's blood pressure lowering, but there have been some concern. You do have an osmotic diuresis. There's polyuria, polydipsia. There is the potential for electrolyte uh, disturbances. There has been a report of increased bacterial urinary tract infections, although the infections have really mostly been fungal. Uh, yeast infections in, in women and also balanitis in uncircumcised men. The concern of malignancies was raised, it's not really out there, oh, changed my things. There's also uh, been cases of ketosis, both uh, including ketoacidosis in type 2 patients, as well in patients who had type 1. Uh, it's not indicated in type 1 diabetes, but people have given it to them. Uh, there is also a signal of increased fracture, and for at least one of the agents, canagliflozin, an increased risk of lower extremity uh, amputations. That's not been completely explained. <laughs> Now, we're going to talk about the empagliflozin cardiovascular outcome trial. I'm sure you've probably heard about this. Uh, and there were 7,020 patients randomized to empagliflozin, SGLT2 inhibitor, or placebo. Um, and there was a 14% reduction in cardiovascular outcomes. So it met non-inferiority and it met superiority. And the separations of curves occurred very, very early on. Remember, it took the GLP-1s more than 12 months to separate, but uh, empagliflozin, you saw a difference starting around three months. So the idea is that this really is not probably hypoglycemia. It may be other effects of this class of agents. So I'm going to look at heart failure, um, and there was a significant reduction in the risk of heart failure uh, at both doses of empagliflozin. Looking at each dose independently, both doses were effective at reducing uh, admission for heart failure. Uh, there was a reduction in weight seen, uh, and as I mentioned, a uh, four to five uh, millimeter reduction in both systolic uh, and diastolic blood pressure. Uh, there was a concern with these agents that initially there seems to be an increase in LDL cholesterol. But following it out to the long term, there was a slight increase in the beginning, but by the end, they were very similar. Uh, and both doses increased HDL cholesterol, so not such a terrible effect on the lipid profile. Just going to mention very quickly, this is an observational study that came out uh, at the American uh, College of Cardiology meeting, uh, and it's been published, the CVD Real study, which uh, is an observational trial, but looked at five huge databases, U.S., United Kingdom, and three other Scandinavian countries, uh, at all patients who received an SGLT2 uh, inhibitor. And uh, remarkably similar in terms, of they, they used propensity score matching for this uh, trial, and they essentially had all the data captured. Very similar effects across the clinical trial program, and showed a 51% reduction in all-cause death uh, and heart failure uh, in the primary analysis. And so these were really essentially primary prevention patients, not secondary prevention patients as we saw in the Amparig study. And uh, they used DAPA, CANA, um, and EMPA, uh, although in this trial there was very little empagliflozin that we just talked about used. It was uh, in the United States mostly canagliflozin and in Europe mostly dapagliflozin. So it suggests a class effect in reduction of cardiovascular outcomes, but again, observational. Uh, then, just recently, uh, presented at the American Diabetes Association this summer and again at the European Association for the Study of Diabetes this fall in Lisbon, uh, the CANVAS trial. Now, the original CANVAS trial had 4,330 patients, and it randomized patients to either 100 or 300 milligrams of canagliflozin versus placebo. Uh, but then they decided that they would increase the sample size, and they started another trial called the Canvas R study because it included renal outcomes, and they merged these two together, and so they counted all the events uh, together. 
And in terms of the primary uh, major adverse cardiovascular events, CV death, non-fatal in minor carbon infarction or non-fatal stroke, there was a 14% reduction in the risk of the primary event. Um, the significant p-value for non-inferiority, again, it did not include one, so it demonstrated superiority. So the second SGLT2 inhibitor demonstrating superiority in terms of cardiovascular uh, outcomes. Um, you can see the two trials looked at separately, uh, pretty similar, and together uh, favored canagliflozin. Now, that would be wonderful, everything would be hunky-dory, except as there always is something else in a trial. Uh, when looking at some of the other potential outcomes, uh, most of the outcomes, none of the individual outcomes were significant, but together the primary cardiovascular outcome was reached. Remember with liraglutide, all three, uh, CV death, non fatal infarction, and non fatal stroke, were reduced. Uh, there was a reduction in heart failure, um, and CV death or hospitalization for heart failure, not a significant reduction in all cause mortality. Uh, there was a signal of increased fractures in both of the programs and together. And I think one of the things that's most concerning is that there was really a markedly increased risk for lower extremity amputations, both minor and major, which remains unexplained and was not seen in their phase three clinical trial program. Um, and no clear predictor of amputation except for being exposed to canagliflozin. So now there is this risk of amputation that is in the SGLT2 inhibitors, but it's only been seen with canagliflozin thus far and only in this series of trials. Uh, they did look at renal outcomes, and there was a 40% reduction in uh, end-stage renal disease uh, or death. Uh, there was a reduction in the progression of albuminuria, significantly reduced by about 27%. And there was a 30% regression of patients who already had albuminuria in terms of their rate of albumin excretion. And there appear to be favorable effects of the SGLT2 uh, inhibitors. They restore glomerular tubular balance, this nebulous concept that I've never really understood. Although I think we called it tubular glomerular balance when I was a medical student. Uh, so similar to ACE inhibitors, it has a beneficial effect on filtering and does lower, uh, all the agents have demonstrated to lower uh, albuminuria. So with that in mind, we have um, insulins that are not inferior, don't improve cardiovascular outcomes. We have the TP4 inhibitors that um, have not been demonstrated to uh, improve cardiovascular outcomes, but are certainly not inferior to our therapies, uh, and are associated with not an increased risk for weight gain and a low risk for hypoglycemia when used by themselves. And we've got the GLP-1 receptors, and two have been demonstrated to reduce cardiovascular uh, risk. Uh, we have the SGLT2 class of drugs, both empagliflozin and canagliflozin have shown to significantly reduce cardiovascular outcomes. Some baggage with canna in terms of this amputation, which needs to be further studies. So what are our antihypoglycemic therapy recommendations after all these studies? And in the post-accord uh, day. Well, in general, the ADA says less than seven for most people. That is preprandial less than 130, postprandial less than 180. But based upon what was seen in the ACCORD trial, if you're younger, at lower risk, the primary prevention group did not have adverse outcomes, then you might aim for a lower goal. We're going to talk about the competing organization, ACE. Uh, so it might be uh, worth it to have tighter targets, especially since now we have drugs that we can combine uh, that are weight neutral or lead to weight loss and don't increase the risk for hypoglycemia. Looser targets in patients who are older, uh, have comorbidities, especially established cardiovascular disease. We learned that the hard way that the patients who we targeted to have an A1C between 7 and 7.9 in the uh, control group uh, benefited. Um, and we want to reduce the risk of hypoglycemia, especially in older um, patients. And so we do have choices now of agents that can be used in monotherapy and combination therapy that are not associated with an increased risk of hypoglycemia. This is uh, modified by uh, a paper that Silvio and Zucchi at Yale wrote and looking at balancing risk versus benefit, including look at the hypoglycemia, adverse events, the disease duration, the longer duration of diabetes, the higher the risk, 
what's the life expectancy, what are the comorbidities, are there established CVD complications, uh, is the patient really able to participate in a more intensive glycemic control program, and what are the resources, including insurance, available to the individuals. Uh, this is the ADA algorithm, um, says lifestyle should always be part of it, recommends metformin as monotherapy, it's been around for 60 years, if you can tolerate it, has high efficacy, low risk for hypoglycemia, it's either weight neutral or weight loss, uh, side effects are GI, um, rarely lactic acidosis, it really hasn't been seen a lot, in fact we've lowered the GFR criteria, so you can use it in patients whose GFR is over uh, 30. In terms of dual therapy, uh, as you know, there's a tendency to lose glycemic control even if we're able to gain it in the beginning. Um, and that combining it, this is in no particular order. In fact, they were listed in terms of the, the wealth of studies uh, done. There are, for most diabetologists, sulfonurias uh, and TCDs have not been high on the list. But you have your options. Um, failing dual therapy, you can go to triple therapy. Um, among the choices, and then eventually uh, insulin is in the picture, unless you're very hyperglycemic at the beginning, and then insulin's always an option. Uh, so again, metformin recommended, insulin therapy if you're failing other agents. Um, again, some caveats with metformin can reduce B12 absorption, um, so we've got to measure those levels. Um, and there is, um, in the algorithm also, the GLP-1 and DPV-4s. Um, uh, sure. skip that. What they did add was that in patients with long-standing subalpine controlled type of diabetes and established atherosclerotic disease, that empagliflozin or liraglutide should be considered. So they've elevated these two classes of drugs in high-risk patients with type 2 diabetes. Uh, this is the ACE algorithm, the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. They have a lower glycemic target, 6.5. They recommend lifestyle. They're looking at weight loss. Uh, they also individualize the A1C. Um, they want to target both fasting and postprandial glucoses. You want to tailor your therapy to your patient and their particular needs. Minimizing weight gain and hypoglycemia is a priority. And this is their algorithm. In this case, uh, again, they do agree that metformin is appropriate after intensive lifestyle, including medical assisted weight loss. Uh, in this case, the order of the drugs is their preferred order. So metformin. Uh, or a GLP-1 receptor analog, or an SGLT-2 based upon the cardiovascular outcome studies. In terms of combining therapy, again, the GLP-1s are high on the list, the SGLT-2s are high on the list, uh, DP-4s are high on the list, and again, in terms of triple therapy. And eventually, we didn't talk about some of the other drugs like uh, Colcevalam, a bile acid sequestrant, and bromocryptine, old drug, um, which are not used a ton, or the alpha glucosidase inhibitors. Uh, and again, sulfonylureas are pretty played down by the ACE algorithm. Again, this profile of anti-diabetic agents which should be thought about when you're choosing your therapies for your patients. So just in summary, we've described the mechanism of action of newer antihypercemic drugs. We have uh, summarized the results of recent cardiovascular outcome studies, and we have discussed how to develop an approach uh, to the treatment of type diabetes that includes duration of diabetes, comorbidities, especially cardiovascular disease, life expectancy, uh, weight effects, <coughs> risk of hypoglycemia, and patients' resources. So I'm going to spend just a minute to put a plug for a study we're doing, uh, and that is the TAC2 trial, which is a chelation therapy uh, trial. There was TAC1 that came out about 10 years ago. Uh, it was supposed to prove that chelation therapy with disodium EDTA um, did not work. Uh, however, it did, and there was a significant reduction in cardiovascular endpoints uh, in the primary group. But when looked at further, there was uh, a significant reduction, over 40 percent, in patients with diabetes. And if you looked at comparisons of patients with diabetes without diabetes, uh, if you didn't have diabetes, chelation therapy did not do anything. But what is remarkable is it actually reduced the risk of patients with diabetes down to the level of patients without diabetes. And nothing does that, not even statins. So uh, there is now an ongoing NIH trial, and we are part of it, uh, the TAC2 trial, which is randomizing patients with type 1 or type 2 diabetes who have had a prior MI. Uh, they have to have 40 weekly infusions of EDTA. Uh, 
not so easy to recruit for. Uh, but again, hoping to definitively show that we may have another therapy that significantly reduces cardiovascular outcomes in patients with diabetes. So I thank you for your attention. I'll answer any questions. I'll a little bit. Time for one or two questions. Yep. Yeah, so the first uh, four randomized controlled trials that you talked about in the first couple slides, mm -hmm. UK PDS, VAP, afford in advance, uh, none of the patients in those studies were over the age of 75 at the end of, the, at the end of those studies. So uh, do you have anything to inform us about with this, these new drugs, about what to do in people over the age of 75 in terms of decreasing cardiovascular risk? You know, it's a big problem, and in fact, in the uh, the NIH didn't believe for a court that we could actually get people's A1Cs down. So we had to do a vanguard phase. We had to recruit 1,000 <coughs> patients. And during that time, there was no age limits. But it looked like the adverse events were so much more common in patients who were above 80 that they limited that. I think that was a mistake. And I think there really is a push now <coughs> to including older patients in these clinical trials. So none of the trials that I'm actually doing now have an upper age limit. But we don't have that data, and it's very important because uh, we are living longer, um, and we need to have that information about how to appropriately treat our older patients. Yeah, uh, age is obviously a crucial factor in what we've been talking about, and um, the age of the person is well studied, but I, I see very little evidence of studies of the age of the cells themselves, which have, as you probably know, their own aging process. For example, a cell can reproduce 50 times maximally, and that's it. So what do you or your colleagues do about this issue of cellular aging and its impact on diabetes? Uh, I wish I had a good answer. Uh, the Sirtuins have had, been looked at as, as promising, uh, although you have to drink a lot of red wine. It's not so clear how they're going to point out. Uh, maybe Dr. Stewart can comment on how he's going to make cells live longer and beta cells reproduce. Okay. He's better at that than I am. But I wish we had an answer. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.